Hi everyone, welcome to the Edu Avenue's TJ Test Prep YouTube channel. We have an exciting problem solving essay here for you today. Today we're going to be going through the real 2024 math science problem solving essay that showed up on the TJ admissions exam. And we're going to be stepping through the solution step by step together. So we always begin our uh, problem solving essays by discussing what background knowledge is necessary. Before doing anything else, we'd like for you to have a firm grip on two main concepts. First is dimensional analysis, and the second is distance speed time. So if any of these terms look unfamiliar to you, we recommend that you take a look through these two YouTube videos so that you can understand the underlying concepts uh, that will feed into our solution. And uh, both of these concepts happen to be ones that are taught in Algebra 1. We oftentimes get the question, uh, will they ask uh, questions about geometry, algebra two, or trigonometry on the TJ problem solving essay? Uh, the TJ admissions office is technically not supposed to be asking uh, extremely high level math questions as the minimum uh, math level to have completed by the end of eighth grade would be algebra one. So even if there is kind of a geometrically oriented problem, most often you can expect that you can solve it using only your knowledge of algebra one. So uh, take a look through these videos, get a firm grip. Uh, you can pause if necessary and come back, uh, and then we'll start diving into our solution. So here was the 2024 real exam problem solving essay prompt. This is exactly what students got on test day, word for word. Christina recently got her driver's license and her dad is concerned that she is not being careful enough as a new driver. The used car he purchased measures her speed in kilometers per hour, KPH, and he has told her that if she drives over 100 kph, he will take away her car keys for 30 days. Quite a punishment. At the start of summer vacation, Christina drove from her home in Fairfax to her grandmother's house in Richmond, a drive of exactly 100 miles. She left at 10.30 a.m., and her dad told her to take a 20-minute break for lunch along the way and then call immediately upon reaching her destination. Assuming she followed his directions and using the conversion of one mile equals 1.61 kilometers, what is the earliest she could call from grandma's house and not be in trouble for driving too fast? If she takes a 45 minute lunch break instead of 20 minutes, how fast can she drive on average and still arrive at the same time? Express your answers in miles per hour. So at this point, you can pause the video and try to attempt the solution on your own. Uh, then, once you're done, you can come back and uh, view our solution. Hopefully, at this point, you've attempted to solve the problem on your own. Now we can start diving into the framework for uh, our solution. And the question was really asking uh, for uh, three parts. First would be determining the time of arrival, given the 20-minute lunch break. The next uh, question is actually dependent upon the first question. They now want to know what the speed of arrival is with the 45 minute lunch break, or sorry, the speed to arrive um, with a 45 minute lunch break so that we arrive at the same time as we did in the prior step. And then finally, we'll discuss whether or not this monitoring method of uh, calling from grandma's house is really effective to monitor a maximum speed. So those are the three components that we'll solve for here. And we'll go step by step. First step would be to determine the time of arrival with the 20 minute lunch break. So the prompt is asking specifically, what is the earliest she could call from grandma's house and not be in trouble for driving too fast? From the phrase, what is the earliest, we immediately know that we're solving for a time. We know that the formula for, for time is going to be distance divided by speed. And so in other words, time is equal to distance over speed. And so the distance is actually given in the prompt, 100 miles, and they also give us the maximum speed in the prompt, 100 kilometers per hour. So we're not supposed to exceed that maximum limit, right? So uh, if we're aiming to prevent Christina from getting in trouble, uh, we want to go at a maximum of 100 kilometers per hour, right? They're asking for the earliest, so we're going to take the maximum speed there so we can get there as fast as possible without violating uh, the speed limit. So uh, here's the issue. We have a distance of 100 miles, but our speed is given in kilometers per hour. These units are fundamentally incompatible. So we either need to convert 
our distance of 100 miles into kilometers, or we need to convert our speed of 100 kilometers per hour into miles per hour. Well, I think we'd rather make the conversion from miles to kilometers here, so converting the distance, as it is far easier to multiply a decimal by 100 miles, right, rather than dividing um, 100 kilometers per hour by a uh, decimal. So our distance, we could say, is 100 miles times 1.61 kilometers per one mile. So that is 161 kilometers as our distance. And you might be wondering, well, how did we get this conversion factor? Well, in all of our courses, we actually have a, a PSE formula and units cheat sheet where uh, all of these conversions show up. And in this particular prompt, TJ admissions decided to be uh, pretty nice to students. They gave students this conversion factor within the prompt itself. So in, for this particular year, students would not have had to memorize it. Uh, so that's component number one, distance. And now we just need component number two, our speed. That will eventually allow us to find the time. And so the speed is actually given in the prompt at 100 kilometers per hour. So just as a reminder, time is distance over speed. So we could take our distance of 161 kilometers, divide it by our speed of 100 kilometers per one hour to get 1.61 hours. And we could convert this into minutes uh, by saying 1.61 hours, and there's 60 minutes in every hour. So hours and out. Hours and per hour would cancel out, and we are left with 96.6 minutes. And we would think that this is the driving time, um, or that the, this is the time of arrival, but in reality, it's just the driving time. We have not yet accounted for the 20-minute lunch break. So uh, in reality, if we're discussing the time that she's calling from grandma's house, it's both going to be the driving time as well as the time for the lunch break. So she's going to call about 116.6 minutes after she initially departs at 10.30 a.m. So if she leaves at 10.30 a.m. and takes a 20-minute lunch break like her dad instructed, uh, and she's driving at the maximum allowable speed of 100 kilometers per hour, and that gets her there the fastest, right? That leads to the earliest arrival time, as they asked for then Christina would be arriving at 12.26.36 p.m. In other words, 12.26 p.m. and 36 seconds. So that's our exact answer. Some students said 12.26, some students said 12.27, and both of those are good answers, but they could be even more precise. Uh, I would imagine that both 12.26 and 12.27 would be marked correct, um, but I'd, I'd say that the best answer here would be the exact answer. So that concludes the first component. Now we can take a look at the speed with the 45 minute lunch break. So the second part of the prompt asks, if she takes a 45 minute lunch break rather than 20 minutes, how fast can she drive on average and still arrive at the same time? So we need to express answers in miles per hour. So they give us kind of a clear direction for the unit conversion as well here. And from that phrase, how fast can she drive? That immediately gives it away, the word fast. We now know that we're solving for a speed. And we know from our prior knowledge and all the practice prompts that we've been doing in the self-paced course and small group coaching, that speed is simply going to be distance divided by time. So speed is distance over time. From the prior step, we already know that we're still traveling a distance of 100 miles. That didn't change. and once again, we want to be arriving at the exact same time that we did in the last step. So we now have to consider that the lunch break is 45 minutes rather than 20 minutes. That's what changed here. And so the total time that we have to be driving is going to be 71.6 minutes. And we got that by taking the 116.6 minutes and subtracting the 45 minute lunch break, right? So this was our arrival time minus the lunch break, that tells us how much time we have while we're actually driving. And in hours, that would be 71.6 minutes times one hour per 60 minutes. So minutes and per minutes uh, cancel out here. And we end up with 1.193 repeated, so 3333 3, 3, and so on, hours. So that is our time that we have to drive. Well, we've got a distance and we've got a time. So speed is distance over time. So we can say that we have to drive 100 miles in this many hours 
and it's going to be 83.798 miles per hour, or for the sake of simplicity, we round it to 83.8 miles per hour. Although here you could really use any number of decimal places. The prompt didn't specify uh, anything to, to this end. You could also be doing this in fractions, but uh, it may end up taking even longer uh, with, with fractions in, in this particular scenario. So uh, we know that these are not the easiest numbers to be dividing. Uh, the unfortunate reality is that on the TJ admissions exam, you don't have a calculator. So uh, you would have to do this long division by hand. And while it's not fun or easy, it's definitely doable. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time. So uh, our final answer is that with the 20 minute lunch break, so for part one, Christina is expected to arrive at 12 hours, 26 minutes and 36 seconds PM. And with a 45 minute lunch break to arrive at this exact same time, she would need to be traveling at 83.8 miles per hour. And this, if we were to convert this to kilometers per hour, that would far exceed our 100 kilometers per hour limit. So Christina would probably lose her keys for 30 days if her father found out that she did take the 45 minute lunch break instead. So that concludes our second step. Now moving on to the third step, they asked uh, this interesting question towards the very end of the prompt. And it said, do you think that this method of monitoring Christina's driving is effective? And we believe that they're referring to the part of the prompt that says, call immediately upon reaching her destination, right? So once she reaches grandma's house. And our answer would be no, because this monitoring method does not account for other factors or other variables. So first, you could discuss the idea of average speed. And so in a real world scenario, this monitoring method would really only look to capture Christina's average speed throughout the trip, right? It doesn't tell us about whether she uh, violated that maximum threshold for a certain component of the trip, right? Because we're only looking at an average. So it probably would not detect situations where the maximum speed goes over 100 kilometers per hour. A good example of this, Christina could travel for half of the trip, like half of the distance at 100 km or 150 kilometers per hour. She could travel the other half of the trip at 50 kilometers per hour, and her average speed would still be below 100 kilometers per hour. So there, even though she violated the limit by going at 150, her father wouldn't necessarily know. So this monitoring method in this case would not capture Christina exceeding her father's speed limit. So we can easily say that it's not effective. In addition, uh, we oftentimes ask our students to consider other factors that might play into the solution. So factors like traffic or a lack of traffic or weather patterns or even detours could also impact the speed and ultimate arrival time. These factors could also dramatically change uh, both the ultimate arrival time as well as our speed uh, in either the positive or negative direction. So those would be excellent kind of real world factors to be discussing in addition to this first part about averages versus maximums. So our final answer is listed here. This is just kind of summarizing the three parts of the prompt that were asked. And uh, if you enjoyed taking a look at our uh, 2024 problem solving essay solution, you can consider working with us uh, either for the TJ admissions process. Uh, if you are uh, still a rising eighth grader or even earlier, we work with students as early as fourth, fifth and sixth and seventh grade. Uh, so if you are interested in TJ prep, uh, we offer a self-paced course that goes through all of these concepts. It shows students from end to end how to write that student portrait sheet and the math science problem solving essay, how to brainstorm, plan it, structure it as dozens of examples, uh, you know, over 100 practice prompts and so on. Uh, we have worked with over 1,300 students so far over the past eight years and have a 79% overall acceptance rate to TJ. We are now the largest TJ prep center in Northern Virginia. Right? And we have constantly adapted our uh, teaching methodologies to fit uh, the new exam. You can also take a look at our free online admissions blog uh, at tjtestprep.com slash blog, which includes several special insights, tips, and tricks. Uh, finally, if you are interested in either getting some individual tutoring, uh, looking into uh, becoming a doctor one day, so uh, you're interested in the pre-medicine, uh, pre-medical school track. We do pre-med prep as well. And then we also offer college admissions counseling and prep, uh, especially for students who are gearing for some of the top 25 universities. Our students have already received millions of dollars in scholarships uh, and received uh, admission into each of the top US 50 universities, as well as some others internationally like Oxford, Cambridge, et cetera. 
Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at any time uh, at tjprep at eduavenues.com. We are happy to help. Uh, thanks and have a great rest of your day.